Thanks, Dad, for joining me. This is a wonderful opportunity to get to chat with you and about your history and, and our family story. Um, but, you know, it's actually interesting. I, I don't want to start there. Okay. I kind of want to start where we are now. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're in a difficult time. There's a pandemic. There is um, police brutality. And now there's this, you know, uh, insurrection in the country that has, um, you know, affected some of your churches. Yes. Um, perhaps you could introduce yourself mm -hmm. to, to the audience. Uh, and in that introduction, talk a little bit about your work today mm -hmm. and how you're feeling in your work in the world today. Okay. So my name is Gerard Americus Green Jr. Uh, I go by Jerry. There's also a nickname that those who have known me over the years uh, will be familiar with. I will not mention that name and anyone who uh, knows that name and brings it forward, uh, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, indeed, uh, and I grew up in uh, Quince Orchard, Maryland. Um, I actually live now a quarter of a mile from the home uh, that I grew up in, which is along Quinn's Orchard Road. Um, and so with respect to, to these times, so what we're going through right now, um, I'm a district superintendent and uh, in the United Methodist Church, Baltimore Washington Conference. And my district is the Greater Washington District, which includes all of the churches that are within um, DC and some within Montgomery County. Um, and so I am concerned about uh, the congregations. Uh, one of the churches that's on my district uh, had a Black Lives sign that was uh, torn down by the Proud Boys and um, burned in the street. Um, and so there's a great deal of concern about the people who were there. There's another church that had a Mount Vernon place who had a sign turn, uh, torn down. Um, and another church down the street. Uh, so I know that there's a great deal of turmoil, a great deal of uncertainty about what's going on. Uh, and so what I have been saying to my pastors, not just recently, but in the midst of all that's been going on is that I asked them to remember um, the story from uh, my religious tradition of Jesus uh, getting in the boat um, and going out to sea. Um, and he'd been in ministry for a period of time and he needed to go and to have some time away. So he find, we find Jesus in the, the, in the front of the boat uh, asleep on a pillow. Um, and a storm starts to, to come about. And the, the waves are being whipped and the boat is being uh, tossed and turned and there's possibility that the, the boat may capsize and the disciples are in the boat and they are becoming worried and concerned about what's going on, the storm tossed seas. But what I try to emphasize with uh, my pastors is that uh, Jesus was able to go to a place within himself in the midst of the storm a place of peace in the midst of the storm. And so when he was there, because he was able to go to that peace in the midst of the storm, when he was awakened by the disciples who were overcome by what was taking place, he was then able to minister to them because he had a sense of who he was and what he was called to do in the midst of the storm. Peace be still. He was able then to calm the seas. He was then able to communicate calm to the disciples and then able to have them go forth and communicate that sense of calm. Didn't keep him from preaching what was right and just to do, but he needed to be anchored in something that was greater than himself, anchored in something that was a steadiness for him in the midst of the storm. And so, that's what I encourage my pastors to do. That for those of us who are uh, within the Christian uh, tradition, 
uh, we would then say that that anchor needs to hold in the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. Okay. In other traditions, they may have an anchor in some other way of addressing that. But there needs to be a place that one can go within themselves to center themselves. And, and, and understand, this pandemic is rough. This, this systemic racism is, is difficult. And having both of those happening at the same time, where you are um, having to, to be within these four walls, it is, is rough. And there are times when it seems like it's overwhelming, but to be able to then realize, even though the storms are raging, who is ultimately in control. And understanding for me that that foundation in terms of that faith took place at a little church on Darnstown Road called Pleasant View. That's the foundation in the faith that has caused me to be able to stand strong in the midst of the storm. And so when I think in terms of the Pleasant View site, when I think in terms of what that place means, it means communicating to the broader community of how that church and those people and those values and those traditions are the means by which we're able to stand strong in the midst of the storm. My bishop says, that the flag doesn't fly higher than the cross. And so my allegiance is to one who is able to help me weather whatever storms come my way. And so yes, there is unrest within the states. I'm 70 years old. <laughs> there was unrest in 1968. Mm -hmm. Um, my mother is 102. She was born at the end of World War I. She came through the Depression. She came through World War II. She came through Depression. She came through Vietnam. That faith, that grounding is what was there for her to help her weather the storm and to seek to have a sense of hope, okay? We just came through the season of Advent and Christmas, and that was focused on that sense of hope being coming into the world, not into a palace, coming in in the midst of the challenges that people were experiencing in that time, coming into the lowliest in a stable, okay? And saying to us that, yeah, times are rough. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit there and just let the times be rough and complain about it? Or are you going to take steps to ensure that the things that are wrong with society, the things that keep us from doing what my mom would say in terms of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, are you going to do something to change that? And I dare say that what Pleasant View is about is sharing a story of about how a people who were separate because of something that happened before they were born, how they were able to find a way to come together to create a different future, a future where they were able to work together. And <clears throat> the blessing for me is that those folk who came together in 68 created an opportunity for folk like you, Jason, to be able to come together and um, go to school together and create opportunities for you to have a, a cadre of friends who represent the diversity of God's creation. That wasn't necessarily the case when I was growing up. And so People say things haven't changed. Things have changed a great deal. There's a great deal more work that needs to be done, but someone needs to be able to tell the story of what it was like and the changes that have taken place and who those people were and what they sacrificed in order to get us to where we are today. And once people under, they understand that story, then they're not going to allow 
uh, people to take that away. They will understand how important it is. You, you went back into your youth in that in that story, and I, and I actually would love to go with you, okay. um, and and for you to take our audience with you as well. Um, you talk about the Pleasant View merger. Just give us a little bit of context. Well, I guess folks are going to watch the film, <laughs> so, so they'll they'll know. One of the things I think that is so challenging about your your perspective in the story, right? We will hear from grandma and grandma will say, people of strong faith will move forward and everything will work out well. What she doesn't say is that her, her own husband was not sure that this merger was gonna work. Right. And so these were a bunch of adults in a room in 1968, your 17 year old kid, president of the youth group, you just told us that people need to hold fast and do the work. And, but how do we know when your mom says go this way and your dad says go this way, how do you know which direction to go? So take us back to 1968 and how that experience was for you. Um, in short, it, it was a, a difficult experience for a 17-year-old because uh, I love both my parents. Uh, my dad was a jack of all trades, looked up to him for his skills and his ability to do things. Um, mom was a person in terms of faith. Both were involved in the church, so respected them both a, a great deal and understood, understood both of their perspectives. You see, dad's grandfather had a role in, in purchasing that land, okay, in setting forth the money uh, to, uh, for the building of that school. Um, and so was very vested in that site. He was a trustee, okay? Uh, he was also a treasurer. He helped build that addition to, to the schoolhouse. So he was very vested in the land, but he had also grown up in a society where things were segregated and there were limits that were placed upon his ability to advance, not only because of education, but because of the segregation that was taking place within society. And so the things that he acquired in terms of his own home, his own land, his own church, okay, those were things, tangible things that he could hold on to. And nobody could take those things away. My mom also had those beliefs, but she also was vested in education in a different way as an opportunity for uh, folk to move forward. She had participated more so in the events that I was engaged in as a elementary, middle, high school student. And so she saw the interaction that was taking place between me and my classmates uh, who were probably, when I was in elementary school, predominantly black, but when schools were integrated, um, more white and black folk interaction with interacting with one another. And so the movement in terms of society was towards integration. And she was also hearing that Pleasant View was struggling financially and the society around the church was changing. What was going to be the possibility of us existing um, independent of those other two churches that were down the road? And so for me, <laughs> from fifth grade on, I gone to school with kids who were white, who were black, who were brown, and we had interacted. We had gone to dances together. We had dated one another. We fought with one another. We participated in sports with one another. So our interaction, it was an integrated type of, of interaction with one another. And so in my mind, it was like, this is the way the church should be. But there are other folk who are my age who did not feel that way. And so it was a tense time, not just in terms of the, the, the older adults, in terms of uh, feeling as though they were going they didn't want to give up something, but also in terms of, of, uh, of 
the young folk who were, who were my age. The struggle was one in terms of, so how, how do I stay at home <laughs> knowing that my dad is one way, my mom is the other. Um, it was a difficult situation, but for me, the only way to go was for, to go for a merger because in my mind, that was fulfilling what I believe Dr. King was calling us to do. Uh, that the demonstrations and the, the move towards civil and equal rights meant that we all needed to give up something in order for us to be a better we. Um, and I, in my mind, that's what we were moving towards, becoming the better we, taking that which was the best from this tradition and that tradition and bringing them together uh, to create something new and different. There were losses in, in that merger uh, in terms of some friendships, in terms of some traditions, uh, the uncertainty, my dad's uncertainty about, he was trustee chairperson, he was treasurer. Would he be able to have those positions when he went into the new church? I think one of the things that, and initially he did not attend. I think that one of the things that one of the pastors did that brought my dad on board was that uh, there was a need for some construction to be done at the church. The pastor asked dad to do it. Dad came to the realization that yes, my skills are valuable and are unique. Uh, and so there needs to be a, a sense of intentionality that's involved in, in bringing pe people together. You need to recognize that there are skills that they have and those skills are valuable and you need to find a way of lifting those skills up as opposed to saying, well, no, you can't do that. No, no. It's about building people up and creating opportunities for, for people to be working together, collaborating with one another. I don't know if I've answered the question or not, Jason. I think you have. One of the things that, that resonated with me in, the, in that answer is in talking about your dad's experience you said that you understood his perspective because so often we we will simply throw titles on people and assume the motivation based upon the title so grandpa didn't want to desegregate didn't want to integrate and that assumes then that he didn't like white people that he assumes all these things with it but but you talk about actually understanding the perspective and his walk and Talk, maybe keep going on on that. Sure, sure. So, so that that's a good point because people could assume so. Dad didn't want to go, so the assumption could be that he did not like white people. Well, that's that's not the case at all because Dad interacted with white folks. There was a man, Mr. Combs, who lived down at the the end of Quince Orchard Road, and he had skills as as a mechanic. Dad has skills in terms of carpentry, so they exchanged their skills. Dad needed his car worked on; he would go there. Uh, Mr. Combs needed something done in terms of work around the house, in terms of uh, uh, carpentry. Dad was there. So there was that interaction. There wasn't the hatred in terms of, of, of white folk. It had to do with whether or not I'm going to be valued for who I am. And so as I make that journey into this church, are people going to see me? They're going to, first of all, notice that I'm a black person, okay, by the, the color of my skin. But are they going to value me as a person, as an individual, as a child of God? In creation, God breathed into us the breath of life, created us in God's image. That breath of life is in each and every one of us. We're all made in the image of God. Don't allow this exterior color to keep you from seeing the God that is within you. Okay, um, and so it took some time for me to, to, to understand dad's perspective. Um, and, and I appreciate it even more now because he was wanting to hold on to, to that which generations before had sacrificed to obtain. Uh, There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into acquiring that land and keeping that property, okay? And so there was uncertainty about whether or not this would work and what would happen if it didn't work. 
what was going to happen to us in the process. So there's, there's that dual sense of I'm the provider for my family, but I'm also the caregiver for the legacy that has been passed on to us by my foreparents. And how am I going to protect that legacy? I'm not just going to give it away. I'm going to make certain that it is cared for because there's a story that needs to be told about those who came before. And there's a, there's a lesson that is learned from those who came before. Hopefully a lesson that I passed on, on to you. Yes, a lesson that I've, 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 I've not only heard, but seen, which I so think what, is the best way to learn a lesson. So what, have, what, what lessons have you learned? From that, from what has been passed on, what what is significant for you? It's funny, you know. I, I, this experience has revealed so much about me. Okay. That wasn't the intent, you know. I wanted to capture and preserve a story of our past, but in that process, I found all these elements of me. Um, you know, in Fair Haven. I see the diversity of friends that I have. Mm. I didn't have to be told to go out and plant many seeds and you know pluck all the roses, but I saw it. And you know that's that's the the, the group of of spirits that I've been blessed with. Um, I've made the concept of community building my life's work, and get to come back and and recognize that you know the concept of Pleasant View which is like, was the center of the black community and to understand how it's the confluence of physical spaces, uh, you know, humanity, right? And spirituality, how all those things uh, mix to actually build uh, the concept of community is how I end up doing the, the work that I do with in the built environment and with technology and with not knowing you know, a lot of people look and say, Jason, you're all over the place in the work that you do, but it all makes sense to me because it's a community building exercise that turns out uh, was a lesson that I saw, was a lesson I was taught and is running through my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think, well, one of the, the, the you know, lessons I learned, but want to hear you articulate uh, is around this idea, you've said it in two different ways, this concept of sacrifice. Because it's not a word that we hear talked about uh, very much right now. And when you talk about sacrifice for the greater good, sacrifice for the community, what do you mean? Because right? right now we're in a world where I protect my family, you don't talk to my family, I tell, you know, if it's good for me, then we celebrate it and it's instant gratification. So when, when you talk about greater good sacrifice, help people understand really what you're talking about. Oh, wow. The idea that It's not just about, about me. It's about what we're able to accomplish together. And so in order for us to be able to do things together, it may mean that I need to give up something in order for there to be a greater good. In order for there to be a greater good, it was necessary for each of those three churches to give up something in order to create a new and different future. Um, two of those churches gave up their property. Uh, each of us in those congregations gave up some of our friends who were unwilling to go forward into that new venture. What is it that you are willing to give up to ensure that you're able to live into the great commandment, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, are you willing to share a portion of 
your financial resources with those who do not um, do not have? Are you willing to uh, give up, sacrifice, uh, not buying that most expensive car and sharing a portion of those resources with someone else? Are you willing to live in a smaller home uh, and perhaps use some of those resources to, to help someone else that, that is in need? Um, are you willing to give up some of your time to go out and volunteer to feed the folk who are, are homeless? Uh, to be available to pass out food in the midst of the, of the pandemic. Uh, there are sacrifices that people are making every day. And it's interesting that as I watch the sacrifices, it's, it's perhaps those who have the least who are willing to sacrifice the most. They don't seem to be tied to the material things, to the money. They seem to say, I have the ability to help someone who is in need, and I'm going to do that. So the marvelous stories that I'm, that I'm seeing on the internet and reading about kids who, who are wanting to help out and creating new ways of, of being, in my words, in ministry with, with folk who are in need. The little girl who wrote that note to the, to the person in the Capitol Center who was being squeezed in the doors, asking, saying to him to get well and, and a note of encouragement. Didn't have to do that. Sacrifice time in order to do that. But what are we willing to do? Giving of ourselves to make the world a better place. It's interesting. There was a theme that uh, when we talked with Aunt Esther earlier, Grandma uh, earlier, both of them looked back on this small, poor farming town with reverence, right? When they didn't have as much. But I think it speaks to this point that you're getting at, which is what you had was a lot of love. You had this dependence on one another and perhaps a shared sense of something, right? Because maybe because we did not have much, we needed to be dependent upon one another, okay? Uh, if I have everything I need, why, why do I need to interact with you or to be concerned about you? We were a community that was mutually dependent. Somebody raised chickens, somebody raised turkeys, somebody raised hogs. We came together to butcher and we shared the meat. Someone had a garden, okay, and I shared what I had. Didn't necessarily have to sell it to you, but you know that this person needed. And so you provided for them. Um, maybe that's what we learn from other countries who are not as well off as we are. The sense of community, the sense of dependency upon one another. Um, the community that I live in, I don't know the folk who are around me and I accept responsibility for that, but I knew everybody along Quince Orchard Road because we were mutually dependent upon one another if the snow came, okay, on Fellowship Lane, we all had to come together to shovel out. We were mutually dependent. We all had to sacrifice some of our time in order to get out, in order to be able to go to work, okay? So that, that sense of dependency and sense of community uh, in some way is lacking, but <laughs> the blessing of the pandemic and in some ways the blessing of snowstorms <laughs> is that, uh, there's a sense of community that can come about as a result of that. Um, I notice more people out walking and the greeting. And so now you're able to recognize and see folk and, and in some ways talk to folk where before we were so rushed and going and doing things that we weren't able to make those connections. Snowstorms are great because uh, I have a little tractor. So I go out and I use that tractor to plow sidewalks and people are, are thankful. And so now they know that I'm the person with the little tractor and they wave. And so sense of building some community. around. Me. And is that the semblance of, Quint like, is that what Quince Orchard, when you think back about Quince Orchard, for those that don't know, right, this small sleepy farming town, the intersection of Quince Orchard and 28, 
Is that what Quint Orchard is? Is it this sentiment of community, dependence? Community, dependence, uh, dependence, but also independence, creativity. I'm thinking as, as a child, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of toys and things, so we went out into the woods and we created forts and we had to be, use our minds to, to create opportunities for us to, for us to have fun. Um, the sense of knowing everybody and the sense that knowing that parents not only took responsibility for their own, but also for the other children within the neighborhood, knowing that there was somebody who was always looking out for the kids. So that I knew that if my children went down to the Robinsons, okay, uh, that Mr. Robinson would be checking on them, watching them. And if I did something wrong, then he would correct me. And before I got home, it would be communicated to my parents and they would correct me, okay? Um, and it was done not to get me in trouble. There was a sense of love there and a sense of respect and caring to make certain that, that things were being done well, that everybody was being cared for. I'd say there was love. There's love. love. Pleasant View, part of the challenge, even that your dad talked about, uh, was whether or not Pleasant View could survive a merger. Mm. You know, it has. Fair Haven, three churches came together to create Fair Haven. It exists. Mm -hmm. And a mile down the road, Pleasant View Historic Site with the Quince Orchard Colored School, the Pleasant View Church and the Pleasant View Cemetery still remains yes. some 52 years later. And overall, you know, has survived for 152 years. Talk to me about the duality of that existence, right? Sometimes you want to talk about Fairhaven. Sometimes you want to talk about Pleasant View. The reality is they both exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And so what, what does that tell us? Sure. So the buildings exist at Pleasant View. The spirit of the people is at Fair Haven. Um, and so Pleasant View allows people to be able to go and touch and feel uh, the site and, and um, to get in and, and, and to walk through the buildings and perhaps to get a sense of the spirit. But what really brings life to the Pleasant View site are the people at Fair Haven, because that's part of the legacy of Pleasant View, the legacy of Hunting Hill, the legacy of McDonald Chapel. The people, those people came together, invested themselves in something new and different. That's the living legacy of Pleasant View, of Hunting Hill, of McDonald Chapel. That's why both need to exist together because people need to see from whence we have come. Pleasant View is a very real uh, picture of from whence we, this is what we were like, this is what we have become as a result of some people in a, at a particular time willing to come together and create something new and different. Um, and understanding that the fair haven of 1968 is vastly different from the fair haven of 2021 and yet there's still more work to be done because the courageous conversations that took place in 68 need to also take place now because there's a different generation that has has come since then and we need to be faithfully telling the story to each generation lest they forget the struggles of the past and then start going through and doing the same things that they were doing in the past. I think part of the challenge of today is that we were neglectful in telling the story to the generations that are, that are currently here. They need to hear what happened in 68 in order not to repeat that stuff that we went through. Um, did I answer your question? I don't know. I'm not sure. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing from that is a really important takeaway because so often people want to say 
Churches merged in 1968. It's a beautiful story. Well, and what I'm hearing you say is the work continues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> one of my, and I need to choose my words carefully here. Fair Havens has such a wonderful story to tell. And my sadness is that Fair Haven is not overflowing with folk. Uh, that it is not the beacon of light for the entire community, as an example. And yet, I see you and I see Chad, and I see other folk who are products of the parents who attended Fairhaven, who are out and they are engaging in the community. And they, by the way that they are living in their engagement with people of diversity, they are spreading the Fairhaven message that we are all created in the image of God, that we are called to love one another, that we are to be in ensuring that justice and righteousness are things that are guaranteed to all, that we don't all have to think and act the same, but we do need to respect one another, that there's ministry that we can engage in together in spite of our political differences, that we can disagree without being disagreeable, okay? There are, there's a variety of political perspectives at Fair Haven, but the folk have been able to come together and engage in ministry and be able to move forward as a people of faith. Um, but in order to do that, you first of all need to see beyond the color and see who the person is and be willing to invest that time. I don't think people are willing to make that investment of time and energy to get to know people. We're in too much of a hurry. Pandemic has slowed us down. Something you said in that regard is uh, sometimes you need the opportunities to create the spaces for the conversation and that community building to actually occur. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what I'm hearing you say is that we just we're, we're zipping past each other. How do we actually create the time and the intention to build a relationship upon which something can be sustained? Hmm. Create a June fest, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that's a great point. I mean, if that's part of what. You, let me ask the question this way: You know, you think about Pleasant View and its role. Like, why does it? You know, you asked why is it meaningful to Grandma? You know, why is it meaningful to you? And it might be that it can provide that space. Absolutely. So there needs to be an intentionality about creating space for people to engage in conversation that will move the agenda forward. And so what the Pleasant View site, I pray will be about is creating the opportunities for that engagement. Uh, not just a June Fest, but uh, opportunities for uh, Montgomery County Schools to come in and have tours of the site and then be able to engage in conversations with people who were attendants who attended the school, uh, to be able to view things, but also to have a sense of from whence we have come to understand that uh, change does happen, but it requires people who are willing to do, not just stand on the side, but willing to do. And I have to say that for me, seeing and just just a proud dad saying, seeing you engaged in this says to me that you're living into those words that your grandmother speaks about. Doers do. Going back several generations, Gary Green saw that there was a need within the community for school. Didn't have to, so slavery had just ended. Okay, there's a need for a school. Doers do. So he was able to get together with additional folk and create the resources whereby school and a church was there. There's a story that needs to be told about the Quince Orchard community. Jason and Keisha 
realize that. They came together, doers do, created finding fellowship as a means by which that story is being told. There's a story that needs to be told to the broader community about Quince Orchard and how people are able to come together and create a new and different future. The trustees have come together and they have been doers over these last years in order to come to a point where they're now able to raise funds to, to, to uh, restore, and rebuild and create an environment where people can come and have those courageous conversations and then be able to, to move the agenda forward. And the agenda is about being in relationship with one another, about creating a beloved community, a community in which we realize that we're all created in the image and likeness of God, that we're all valuable, that we all have gifts and graces that need to be acknowledged and, and lifted up and valued, and that we are so much greater together than we are apart. Now, thank you for that, including me in that. I think people need to understand the realities of the work that you're talking about, because when we talk about walking in love and in faith, it sounds like that path is lined with satin and it is easy. And, um, you know, I, I want to make people aware that 68 happened, the merger happened, and then people left and friendships were fractured and families were divided. And, and so talk a little bit, whether in the Fairhaven context or just in general, when we're talking about this work, it, how do you sustain when it's hard? So you need to be grounded in something greater than yourself. Uh, for me, that is my faith. Um, in a sense of purpose. Um, for me, it is living into the great command of loving God with my whole being, loving self and loving neighbor as self. And so the work that I do is living into that, realizing that there are some neighbors who don't necessarily want to be loved, uh, that like is not necessarily a part of love, that you don't necessarily like me. I don't necessarily have to like you to, to love you. Mm. Uh, what it's saying is that I am not going to do anything that is going to put you in harm's way that I'm not going to harm you, that I'm going to be looking out for, for your best interest. I may not like the behaviors that you are engaging in. And as a, because I love you, I can share with you that I feel as though those behaviors are self-destructive, okay? okay? But in the process, I'm not gonna write you off. I'm gonna still care about you. Uh, that becomes evident when you're, you know, it's like family dynamics. You know, there are members of your family that may do things that tick you off, okay? But we are family, okay? And, and therefore, I may not like the behaviors that you have engaged in, but you are still family and I still love you. We may not talk for a few days, okay? Uh, uh, but I still love you. And if you need me, I'm going to be there for you. Okay, that, that's part of what family is about. In some ways, that's part of what church should be about, and that's what community should be about. Um, I wish that those in Congress would be able to kind of embrace that, that we can disagree. We don't have to be disagreeable. We need to find common ground in order to move a country forward, that it's not about me. It's about us. It's about us. That. Um, in light of our, our short time that's left, um, I do want to ask you to tell two stories uh, or uh, two questions, forgive me. One, one's asking you to tell a story. Can you tell the story of how Fellowship Lane got its name in oh, the sure. vein of community? Yes, yes. So 
in the film, you probably have seen Fellowship Lane. Fellowship Lane was a dirt road. Uh, and uh, there were, there was a, as you go down, it was probably about a quarter of a mile. It was one lane. And uh, you needed, if you were going one direction, there were little spaces where you could kind of pull off to let another car come by or something like that. But when there was a heavy rain or more so when there was snow, it was a very difficult for people to get out. And so the members, the people who lived along uh, the road needed to come together, okay, and to shovel their way out. Other times they were kind of dependent upon one another. At Christmas, we would exchange gifts and things of that sort. During the summer, we would have parties together. So there was a great deal of interaction, uh, fellowship with, with one another. And so uh, I think it was my dad who had um, there been a petition to get a road down Fellowship Lane, uh, down the road to have it paved. And once it was paved, there was a question about what it should be called. And so um, one of the pastors, Reverend Anna Talley, who happens to be one of our aunts, uh, came up with the name of Fellowship Lane. And so the reason she called it, suggested Fellowship Lane, is because of the way that the people were able to come together and, and be supportive of one another and fellowship, creating community. And so the name Fellowship, Fellowship Lane was significant in terms of the meaning that it had for the community. It was where people were able to fellowship uh, together, create a sense of commonality, of common purpose, and be able to move forward together. So I fellowship. love that. I love yeah. that story. And it's also why the title of the film is Finding Fellowship. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a double entendre okay. because in one respect, it's the, effort of identifying history, right? The history that you just shared about the name Fellowship Lane is what we're finding fellowship, that community of Quince Orchard, which Fellowship Lane represents. But it also talks about the actual practice of community yes, and how yes. we need to be in what you just called doing the work every day of actively seeking out opportunities to find fellowship with one another. Uh, to build community with one another, to have this shared respect for one another, and that that's really the only way that we can can come together. I mean, I think the lesson is that a diverse people coming together in purpose is one of the most powerful forces this world has ever known, but we have to actively and intentionally engage in that effort. Yes, yes. We can't just sit on the sidelines. Doers do. <laughs> Doers create the opportunities for that fellowship to take place. Um, Dad, let me ask you this question, um, just, just to bring it, um, <clears throat> that's probably the last question. What, what, my question is, you know, why is Pleasant View too precious to lose? But I think in some respects you've answered that. Uh, let me frame it this way. There are people who are gonna be watching the film, there are people who are gonna watch this commercial um, some of which are people of faith, some of which are more specifically people of a Methodist faith. There will be people who are not of Christianity. There are people who are, have no faith at all, but are living in a world today that seems divided and chaotic and are looking for direction. Mm. What lesson might they draw from your experience in Quince Orchard, from this film, from this merger, you know, What's, what's the takeaway for the people of Montgomery County and, and Maryland? How do they, how do we move forward? That's a heavy question, Jason. That's, that's uh, another hour. When I think in terms of uh, Quince Orchard, I think of home. Mm. Maybe what everybody is looking for it's a place they can call home. The place where they can go and feel accepted, that they're always welcome, 
doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter the time of day. It's a place where you can go and you can feel a sense of love and respect. It's a place where uh, your values were established. It's a place where you can go and feel at peace that uh, the world is not intruding upon you, that uh, I can sit down and I can perhaps engage in a conversation with somebody and, and there's a mutual kind of respect that we have for one another, that I know that the person that I'm sitting across from cares for me and that uh, they have my best interest at heart. Um, I think everybody is looking for that sense of, of home, the place where they can go to, to have that sense of peace, where the cares of the world are still there, but it's the way, the place I'm able to go where I'm able to gain my strength and then I'm able to deal with what the world is placing before me. Um, some would say Camelot, I say Quince Orchard. It was that place ah, that wasn't perfect, but it was the place that was home. And maybe what we're all looking for is that home. And we're trying uh, to create it by acquiring all kinds of things and coming to the realization that don't need any of that. That home is where the heart is. Home is where the people are. Home is where there's a sense of community. And you know that the people that are there care about you and have your best interest at heart. And that sense of home and community can be created wherever you are. If you're willing to give of yourself in creating it. Mm. One of the things that just hit me as you said that is perhaps you can't find home until you create it for someone else. That is truly huh. in this action of making home and community and creating that respect and comfort mm. that you may receive it. It's interesting you say that. So there's a giving that has to take place, okay? But there also needs to be a willing to receive. Um, to share a story, my, my dad was a giver. You needed something done. He was always willing to do that. He was the type of person who would care for somebody else. But there came a time when uh, dad became ill, okay? It was hard for dad to receive care. What we need to realize is that the joy that we have in giving, understand that when we are willing to receive, we allow others to experience that joy. And so maybe home is about learning to give and to receive um, the love that is, that is abundant in the world. We just need to be willing to receive it and to give it to others. Hmm. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you heard me say it to grandma, but you know, it's such a, treat is an understatement, joy, blessing to be able to walk this journey with you and not only learn lessons, but see lessons lived out. And, um, you know, there, I can imagine no, no better teacher uh, in this journey than you. So thank you. Share with you the blessing that uh, I think I've shared it with you before. I wish that I had been able to have these types of conversations with my dad. Um, thank you.